Cemetery Hill by Michael Robertson, Jr. 1. Cemetery Hill never frightened me until they buried my best friend. 2. Well, it wasn't that he was buried there that frightened me. Lots of folks are buried there, after all. It was what I saw after the burial, once night had fallen for the first time across my friend's freshly filled grave, that made me pull the covers over my head like a child afraid of the boogeyman easing open their closet door. 3. I watched my friend's casket be lowered into the ground, and in that moment, I couldn't keep myself from imagining what he might look like inside there. How dark it would be, how deafening the silence would seem once the earth had been refilled. As I walked back to my car and drove home, I never imagined that later I'd be wondering whether he would stay where they'd put him, there in the ground, where the dead belong. 4. A part of me, the part that ran full of energy through the memories of my youth, would forever mourn and miss my friend, wishing to see him again. What a goddamn stupid wish that was. Because... Shit. I'm not doing a great job with this. My head hurts and my vision is blurry. I've lost track of how long I've been awake. But I've got to get this out before I either convince myself it was all a dream or I lose my nerve. Because it's real. I swear. It is real. Hang on. I'm going to go brew another pot of coffee. And then I'll try to start over from the beginning. 5. I'll tell you about the hat, that fucking thing that first took up the job of haunting me, but I said I'd start at the beginning, so I need to fill in some context. I can't assume everyone who might read this, if anyone ever does, knows me or is familiar with the town, so it's important that you have enough details, places and people, for starters. My name is Jeremiah Whitlow. I'm 28 years old, and I'm typing this on my laptop in what used to be my childhood bedroom, which is where I've been sleeping for the past four months. If you're from Red Lake, you probably know me and my parents. If you've never met me but my name sounds vaguely familiar to you, it's because you might have seen it in the news earlier this year, if you keep up with technology at all, when I sold my software company to one of the big dogs in Silicon Valley. I'd already been doing very well for myself, but when the sale went through, it became official. I would never have to work again a day in my life if I chose not to. I knew that wouldn't be the case, though. It's not who I am. I can't imagine spending the rest of my years doing nothing, not building something, not creating. Hell, despite my exhaustion, even writing this, this awful thing I must document, it's still scratching that ambitious itch I've been plagued with since I was young. Since Jordan DeMarco and I built our first game together and started imagining our future in the tech world. Yes, that's right. When we were young, while most kids in elementary and middle school were dreaming of being star athletes or actors, with the occasional overachiever reaching for the title of doctor or lawyer or even president of the United States, Jordan and I dreamed of a world built completely in the binary, of ones and zeros, computer code. One of us got to live that dream. The other of us never left Red Lake, and was buried in Broad Street Cemetery just a few days ago. 6. Red Lake, Virginia gets its name because on the south side of the county, just outside the city limits, with the Lakewood Park ball fields butting right up against it, is Red Lake. Red Lake gets its name because, aside from the ball fields as fences, by the way, at the Lakewood Park fields, kids hitting home runs don't go yard or hit dingers or the ever-boring hit one out. They get wet, much to the chagrin of some parents. The lake is surrounded by large birch trees that tower into the sky and are reflected deep into the lake's surface. In the fall, when the leaves turn, that reflection bursts a light with rich oranges and reds, and the rippling water causes the colors to dance like flames. 
it's gorgeous and mesmerizing and also sometimes terrifying, hellish. That's Red Lake. Broad Street Cemetery gets its name because it's on Broad Street. Not every name has an interesting story behind it. At what is technically the very back of Broad Street Cemetery, if you were to walk through the wrought iron gates that guard the front and then keep walking until you eventually run out of gravestones, you'll find yourself atop Cemetery Hill. Broad Street Cemetery is technically a garden cemetery, mostly because of its origins on Cemetery Hill, with the grounds as old as graves peppering the sloped hillside in a fashion you don't see with modern cemeteries anymore, and dotting the ridge at the top in a way that makes them look like crooked dominoes from a distance when viewed against a darkening sky, or a row of rotting, misshapen teeth. I, probably more than anybody else in Red Lake, am incredibly familiar with the view of Cemetery Hill. If I was gifted in the visual arts, I could draw it for you from memory, right down to the exact placement of the tree branches of the old oak that stands guard on the east side of the hill, stubbornly surviving against all odds and years and weather. I could do this for you, because if you crested Cemetery Hill and made your way down its backside, then walked less than a hundred yards straight ahead, you'd arrive at my house's backyard. Once you're there, if you look straight up, you'd find a second-story window just to the right of center. That's my bedroom window. It is, in fact, the window I'm occasionally glancing out now as I type this, not wanting to, but unable to stop myself. The sun is still out, for now, which allows for more bravery. Maybe it's because I was essentially born into looking out my bedroom window toward a cemetery that has never frightened me until now, not even when I was younger and fell into the childhood cliché of certain horror films requiring me to sleep with several nightlights twinkling throughout my room. Jordan wasn't buried on Cemetery Hill. Nobody has been for over a hundred years. But that's where I saw him again after he died. 7. J.J. Games When we were 13 years old, in between our homework and thoughts of girls, that's the brilliant marketing decision we arrived at. Our company would be JJ Games. JJ for Jeremiah and Jordan. Games because we were going to make games. Not every name has an interesting story behind it. We continued through middle school and high school with a mostly normal existence. We weren't super popular, but we also weren't ostracized. We might have both been good with computers and a bit on the geeky side with some of our hobbies, but we both also played sports. Track and field for me, my best event was the 400 meter, baseball for Jordan, right field. Neither of us were standout in athletics, but I think it was the team camaraderie that kept us in it. When you're in high school, it feels very important to be a part of something because so few young people can figure out how to be content with just being themselves. And through it all, we had our games. We played a lot of them, both on consoles and the PC, but we made a lot too, experimenting with different programming languages and applications. Some were okay, most were bad, silly, sloppy things, the work of kids trying to learn, But all of them were a blast to make. God, the laughs we had while huddled around a keyboard and screen. The shared frustrations of a complex problem. The reveled in joy of a solution clicking into place. I suppose I'm lucky, being that my memories of high school are mostly pleasant. But I don't know that I've ever experienced such fondness as I do when I think back to my time building games with Jordan. At least, I used to. 8. Jordan and I were alike in a lot of ways, but as we got older, even though our friendship remained strong and we continued to share certain passions, our differences started to become more apparent to me, and now that I can look back and be honest about it, more problematic. Grades. I had mostly A's, with a B tossed in now and then, and while I didn't find high school particularly challenging, I made sure to work hard enough to keep my GPA up. Jordan did well in things he enjoyed, which amounted to nothing except math and computer classes come high school, but he made no effort in anything else. 
he'd scrape by with D's in things like English and chemistry and biology. And when I'd ask him about it, he'd just shrug and laugh and say things like, I don't need to know the periodic table to make a video game. Or, fuck English, are we going to make a game about Shakespeare? As we seemed to sprint toward adulthood our senior year, I'd understood perfectly that Jordan was not dumb, far, far from it, but lazy and mostly apathetic. There was an ignorance to him, a misunderstanding of how the real world worked, or how it would work once we were in college and out on our own. Jordan really thought that we were going to sit in our bedroom and goof around with shitty video games, and that would be how we made our living. That adulthood would be nothing but high school without the curfews and teachers and pep rallies. I didn't find out he never applied to any colleges until the day I got my acceptance letter from UVA. I'd assumed he'd apply to the same schools I had, because every time we talked about it, that was the impression he'd given. Turns out, the entire time, it was Jordan who was assuming. Assuming I was the one messing around, that I wasn't really going to leave him here, alone with our dream. But that's exactly what I did. 9. I don't know why Jordan had the hats made. I suppose maybe it was his attempt to cling on to something that he knew was fleeting, or possibly a last-ditch effort to convince me I was making a mistake by heading off to school. My last week before my parents would drive me the two hours to Charlottesville and move me into my dorm room was filled with a short vacation to Smith Mountain Lake with my mom's brother and his family, where I got an embarrassingly bad sunburn on my forehead that I prayed would clear up before move-in day and then a final few days of packing and enduring my parents' not-so-subtle attempts for us to spend as much family time together as possible. I swear, they acted like I was heading off to war and not just a hundred miles away to get an education. I'd already told them I'd come back for a long weekend before Thanksgiving. Being that I'm an only child, I suppose their sense of impending loss was greater than I was giving them credit for. Anyway, in all that time, I never got a chance to say a proper goodbye to Jordan, The last time I'd seen him was a couple days before my family's lake trip, where we'd spent the night in his bedroom drinking too much soda and messing around with a new emulator on his PC. In those hours we spent together, I never could figure out whether Jordan was doing a great job at pretending there was nothing final about that night, no underlying sense of an ending, a goodbye, or if it honestly never crossed his mind. Even when he gave me the hat, I wasn't sure. In fact, I may have been even more confused. When I woke up the next morning and started gathering my things to head home, Jordan tossed me a white plastic mailer bag that had already been torn open. Check out what I got us, was all he said. I reached inside the bag and pulled out a baseball cap, dark blue, my favorite color, and with a simple embroidery of JJ Games on the front. I stared at the hat for what felt like a very long time my brain processing so many emotions I felt sick. When I looked up again, Jordan had on a matching cap, except his was red, his favorite color. The grin on his face broke my 18-year-old heart in a way no girl ever had. Figured it's as good a first step as any, right? Now we're official, he said. Not wanting to hear my voice crack, all I did was force a smile and nod. The next thing I knew, I was in my car driving home, fighting off the memory of Jordan shouting to me as I headed out his front door. See you later. The morning my parents drove me to UVA, our route took us down Jordan Street as we made our way through town toward the highway on-ramp. When we drove by his house, we found Jordan and his dad in their front yard, his dad working the hedge trimmers over the bushes, Jordan leaning on a rake and looking bored out of his mind but it was the flash of red that caught my eye first. Jordan was wearing his JJ Games hat. When we drove by, my dad, in his infinite wisdom, tooted the horn. Jordan's dad turned, saw us, and waved. Jordan's eyes locked on the mine, and then he took one hand off the rake and reached up and tipped his hat to me. I guess if we had a real goodbye, that was it. I never wore my hat a single time. 
I tossed it onto the top shelf in my bedroom closet the day Jordan gave it to me, and I never remembered it or saw it again until shortly before Jordan died. 10. The sun is almost gone now, and the shadows are waking up. I look at them differently now. 11. The four years of college went by fast, and with each subsequent summer, I saw less and less of Jordan. I made new friends at school who invited me to visit and go on trips with them, which kept me away from home for weeks at a time. And after my sophomore and junior year, I spent my summers in Seattle working as a software developer intern for a major e-commerce company, who offered me a full-time position upon graduation. I accepted the job, proud and excited and feeling very much accomplished. I was still living out my dream, you see. I still love computers and coding. I had just shifted away from video games and onto more, let's say, practical applications. Smartphone apps and e-commerce were booming, and I recognized the demand and opportunities going down this different road would present. I tried to tell Jordan about all this when I was home for a few days before heading into my junior year. Tried to get him to at least take some online learning courses and experiment with some of the programming languages I was seeing used at my internship. But he only shook his head at me the way a disappointed parent might, and then suggested we fire up one of his retro Nintendo consoles and speedrun all the Mario games. Jordan could have had my life if he wanted it. He had the brains and the creativity. He just never could unstick himself from his dream world long enough to move forward in reality. I tried. I really did. But you know that saying about leading a horse to water. I won't feel guilty. That's what I tried to tell myself. 12. I could have tried harder to help him. 13. That's why he blames me. 14. I spent three years at that first job in Seattle before I got an idea for an app of my own and pitched it to a couple of my closer colleagues. Thus started the most frantic, stressful, wonderful, and exhilarating three years of my life. It began with a what-if discussion over drinks and dinner one night downtown and ended with an acquisition of our company that set us all up for life. Living the dream, remember? Except, while the money was obviously a big plus, and we'd made a great product that millions of users loved, the day I signed the paperwork relinquishing control of the company we'd built, I honestly felt like I'd snapped out of a years-long fugue state. The world outside of computer code and cloud servers and usage metrics suddenly came to life again. I felt like I'd been reintegrated, without warning, back into the world of humans. And once there, once I acclimated, I realized how completely exhausted I was, mentally and physically. I needed to rest, to reset and get myself together, to enjoy some silence and eat some healthy meals and remember what it was to be me. I needed to get out of the city. Red Lake seemed like the perfect place. So, I came back home. And for a while, things were good. But you already know they didn't stay that way. If they had, you wouldn't be reading this. 15. I love my parents, but I was craving solitude. They'd always loved the beach, with a particular penchant for Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, so I bought them a small bungalow there and surprised them with the keys my first night back in Red Lake. They were moved to tears and very excited. But when I told them I was hoping they'd go down and check it out and stay a couple weeks so I could isolate in my fortress of solitude, I think my dad understood, but my mother was hesitant. Won't you be terribly lonely? she asked. We can stay out of your way, but let me stay and at least cook you some good meals. Let me do your laundry so you don't have to worry yourself. I kissed her on the cheek and said, Mom, I can take care of myself. I really need this, okay? Please? They left a week later. I had asked them for a few weeks, but they loved the house so much they've only been back twice in four months, only staying for a couple days to check in on me, as my mom says, and pack a few more things. They may never come back permanently. I'm smiling as I type this, which feels odd, like I shouldn't be allowed to, all things considered, but it feels good to have done something nice for them. I'm glad they're not here for this. 
It was when I realized that my tenure at my childhood home was going to be more long-term than I initially had planned that I found the hat again. Realizing it was silly to continue to live out of the two suitcases I'd brought with me, and getting tired of seeing stacks on my clothes atop the dresser and on the floor beside it, I opened my bedroom closet door and began to hang my shirts and pants. And that's when the dot of blue caught my eye from the corner of the top shelf. My heart dropped at the sight of it, instantly recognizing the only thing it could be. I almost didn't reach for it, afraid of the memories it would unlock if I touched it, really looked at it. Honestly, I hadn't thought about Jordan for a long time until that point. I'd been too busy, too caught up in my new life to be dragged down by my old one. I'd almost forgotten the person who was still, perhaps, the only true best friend I've ever had. Our ending didn't erase our history. We'd never fallen out, we just fell away. I pulled the hat out from beneath an old quilt and blew the film of dust off it, ran my thumb over the embroidered JJ games, but then I remembered that smile I'd seen on Jordan's face that morning he'd gifted me the hat, the way he'd worn his red one so proudly, so full of hope, and the hat fell from my hand and landed on the bedroom floor with a thwop that seemed unnaturally loud. I kicked it into the closet and closed the door, my heart doing something funny in my chest. I swallowed, took a deep breath, and counted to ten. And then, feeling silly and shaking my head, I opened the closet door again and reached down to pick the hat up off the floor. Even then, before things got bad, I felt the guilt swelling inside me. But in that moment, I chose to let the hat be a reminder of the good times Jordan and I had together. I set it on my nightstand and decided to call him with no way of knowing I'd soon be shoving the hat into his casket. 16. The day of Jordan's funeral had weather befitting the event. A morning sky that more resembled dusk blanketed Red Lake as I made my way to the funeral home for the ceremony. Alone, mind you, as I didn't tell my parents about Jordan. Still haven't. And when I emerged a tight 30 minutes later to join the short procession to Broad Street Cemetery, dark clouds of deep charcoal and bruised purple swarmed above us, a rainstorm imminent. It's an odd thing, but driving along slowly with the other cars, following the hearse through town, I felt more at home than I had in months prior. Maybe it was because the small turnout of people were all mostly former high school classmates and teachers of mine, transported me back to a time of my life that felt comfortable, like slipping on your favorite pair of running shoes, and we were sharing in this intimate ritual of death that we knew would one day come for us all. As I drove, I also thought about what I'd done inside the funeral home. At the time, I thought I was being sentimental, making one last nice gesture to my old friend, but I was mostly lying to myself. I just didn't want to see the damn thing anymore. I wasn't the first person to arrive at the funeral home, but there were so few of us who showed up that there was no line at the open casket for people to pay their last respects. Nobody in front or behind me. I almost turned away at the last moment, stopping a couple pews short of the front and choosing to sit down instead of going through with it. But somehow I kept my feet moving and then there I was, inches away from my friend's corpse. I kept my eyes straight ahead for a few seconds, my heart thudding in my chest, sudden fear threatening to send me into a full-blown panic attack. But then I did my slow breath and count the ten trick and felt my heart settle and I let my gaze slide downward. Jordan's face looked much older than when I'd last seen him, just days before, and it had a waxy-looking texture to it, hard lines and creases around his mouth and nose and eyes. He didn't look real more resembling a ventriloquist dummy than anything that had once been a living, breathing human being. It was terrible, troubling me worse than I'd anticipated. But then I blinked, and something even worse happened. Suddenly, as I looked down, I was no longer staring at 28-year-old Jordan. Instead, I saw a version of Jordan from what had to have been our middle school days, maybe 12 or 13 years old at the most, his hair was longer and thicker, curling around his ears the way it always used to, and his skin was peppered with the first signs of the acne that would burden him for the next few years, peach fuzz on his chin and upper lip. 
Instead of the cheap black suit he'd been wearing, he was now dressed in blue jeans and a t-shirt that had printed on it a picture of a collection of different video game console controllers. There were two words printed beneath the controllers in big, blocky font. And as I read them in my mind, Jordan's eyes shot open and he sat up in the casket, grabbing me by the collar and pulling me down, speaking the words from his t-shirt in a voice thick with phlegm. Wanna play? I blinked again, and everything was back to normal. Somehow, I managed to keep my composure. How I'd not screamed out loud is beyond me, even though my heart was pounding in my ears and my breath was catching in my chest. I cleared my throat and then quickly, both to not draw attention to myself and because I wanted to get the hell away from the casket, I pulled my blue JJ Games ball cap from inside my sport coat and stuffed it down into the lower half of Jordan's casket my stomach rolling as my knuckles brushed the fabric of his suit. See ya in the next level, bud, I whispered. Then I went and found a seat. 17. The first few raindrops popped on my windshield as I reached the cemetery. If there was any mercy to be had that day, I suppose it's that the rain held off its downpour until after Jordan was in the ground and we'd all returned to our vehicles. After the stuffiness of the funeral home's chapel, the light sprinkling was more refreshing than a distraction or disturbance. But make no mistake, there was nothing pleasant about what we were doing. As I drove through the gates, my eyes went instantly up to Cemetery Hill, and a part of me wished I could have just kept driving straight, up and over, until I reached my backyard, away from all the sorrow. But who am I kidding? The sorrow would have followed. I hear people these days use phrases like a celebration of life when referring to funerals, but that was not what anyone was doing for Jordan. As the sky continued to darken and as we all walked across the grass to the tent they'd placed over the hole in the ground where Jordan's casket would make its final descent, we knew the truth. This was no celebration of anything. This was a collective mourning of a life wasted. I huddled around the tent with the dwindled crowd that had made it from the funeral home to the burial site, catching a glimpse of Jordan's parents as they clutched each other with tear-streaked faces while a chaplain said what I can only presume were comforting words. But I couldn't tell you what he said, because my mind wasn't with everyone under the tent. I stared at Jordan's casket and I couldn't shake the image of that 12 or 13 year old version of him inside the closed lid wide-eyed and scared and screaming screams that nobody could hear. I wanted to help him, but of course, it was far too late for that. When it was all over, for us anyway, for Jordan's parents, a new life without their son was just getting started, I began the walk back to my car with my head down, focusing on putting each foot in front of the other. When a voice spoke from beside me, and I saw a pair of women's flats join my own shoes in the grass. It's so sad, isn't it? Like, it doesn't feel real, right? I didn't stop walking, but I looked up. Next to me, I found Allison Trolley. A little heavier than she'd been in high school, but possibly even more beautiful. She'd always been a looker. I, in fact, had a crush on her, well, let's see, forever, but I'd always been too shy to act on it and figured I never stood a chance. Last I heard, she'd gone to Penn State and then, who knows? I couldn't tell you why she was back in Red Lake. I doubted very much it was just for Jordan's funeral. It's real, I finally said, the first words I'd spoken to anyone that day. Allison nodded. Some of us are going down to Red Lake Bistro, have a toast in honor of Jordan, and, I don't know, catch up. She grinned and shrugged. Want to join us? We'd reached the cars by then, and I pulled open my door. No thanks. I drove off, glancing in the rear view to see Allison staring after me. Go figure. A decade after high school, my crush asked me out on a date and it happens in the middle of a cemetery after they just lowered our classmate's casket into his grave. No. I came back to Red Lake seeking solitude, and now that's exactly all I deserved. In the two minutes it took me to drive home, the sky opened, and the flood began. 18. 
The day I found my JJ Games hat in the closet, I carried it down to the kitchen and grabbed the beer from the fridge and took a long swig before pulling out my cell phone and finding Jordan's number in my contacts. I'm not really a big drinker, but something about seeing that hat and thinking of calling Jordan after all this time made me think some liquid courage might help smooth the wrinkles of the situation. I tapped his name on my phone and took another swallow of beer while it rang. On the third ring, a female's voice answered. My first thought was, girlfriend? And then, wife? With just the answer of a phone call, I drowned in how little I knew about the person whom I used to know better than anyone. When I introduced myself and asked to speak to Jordan, the woman informed me I had the wrong number. She said she'd had this number for three years, but she still got the occasional call from people looking for somebody named Jordan. I apologize, ended the call, and then scrolled through my contacts again until I found the number I was looking for, figuring it was my last shot. Jordan's parents had apparently bucked the times and kept their landline telephone, and Mr. DeMarco answered with the same gusto he used to when I was a kid, like he couldn't wait to talk to whoever might be on the other end of the line. When he realized who was calling, he sounded even more excited, and he peppered me with questions as we made small talk for the next 10 minutes before I finally explained why I was calling. It was then that Jordan's dad's voice fell, deflating. Well, see, I don't think Jordan has a phone right now. Or, uh, if he does, he hasn't given us the number. Oh, I said. Because, frankly, I had no idea how to respond to this revelation. But, Mr. DeMarco said, I can tell you where to find him, I think. I'm sure he'd love to see you. It'd be good for him. But I've got to tell you, Jeremiah, he's not doing great. 19. The flash flood warning flashed on my cell phone screen the moment I stepped inside the house after Jordan's funeral. From out the kitchen window, all I could see was a wall of water blurring the world beyond. I trudged up the stairs, feeling empty, somehow depleted, as if surviving the morning's events had exhausted my mental reserves. I hadn't eaten breakfast, opting for just a cup of coffee before I'd headed out, but I wasn't hungry despite it being just past lunchtime. Inside the house was dim and gray, and all I wanted to do was take a nap hoping the nightmare images of Jordan in his coffin wouldn't follow me into slumber. I stripped out of my clothes and climbed under the covers. I put my back to the window, not wanting to catch sight of even a blurry version of Cemetery Hill, and fell asleep fast to the sound of the cascading rain. When I woke up, my bedroom was dark and my stomach growled. I dressed in gym shorts and a sweatshirt and made my way back to the kitchen for dinner, Two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches eaten over the sink. I stared out the window while I ate, seeing mostly my own reflection now that the sky had turned black. The rain was still falling hard and fast, and when I finished eating, I risked opening the front door to take a peek at the neighborhood. I found a small pond forming in my parents' yard, near the curb at the edge of the driveway, and there was what looked like an actual river rolling down Hawkins Avenue, the sound of rushing water echoing so loudly from the drains it sounded like waterfalls. A crack of thunder shot through the air, and I jumped backward and closed the front door. The weather might have been dreary, and even ominous, but to me, the soundtrack of the storm was soothing. I was feeling much better after sleeping, as if the rain was helping to wash away my feelings of sorrow and guilt. I'd go so far to say I was feeling rejuvenated. Then the power went out. There were two loud gunshots of thunder, followed by a streak of lightning, and then everything went dark, the house falling silent. If it wasn't for the storm, I don't know if I would have ever seen him. And I don't know if that would have made things better or worse. 20. My dad had always kept two battery-powered lanterns in the closet under the stairs, and sure enough, they were still there. I pulled one out and switched it on, adjusting its glow down to a comfortable level. In the living room, I scanned my mom's bookshelf for something to read and found a mystery novel that sounded good. Settling into my dad's recliner, I read by lantern light, 
listening to the rainfall and the thunder and occasional gusts of wind that rocked the house. I felt very much at peace. When my eyelids began to droop, I headed to bed, holding the lantern out in front of me as I climbed the stairs, feeling quite Dickensian. I set the lantern on the floor next to the bed, and once I was under the covers, I switched it off. Unlike earlier, this time I laid on my side that faced me toward the window. The storm was still hovering over Red Lake, but the rain had softened some, which made me think the worst of the weather must be over. I closed my eyes to go to sleep, and was thinking about what my parents might be doing down at the beach just then, and how maybe in the next few days I'd go down and visit them, when the air outside the house exploded. A cannon shot of thunder erupted, so powerful I swear my bed shook. My heart leaped into my throat, and I sprang from the bed, mind racing. I kicked over the lantern and heard it roll across the floor and thud against the wall. I stood motionless for a couple seconds, getting my breath and my heart rate under control, and then fumbled forward, bent over with my hands groping in the dark along the floor in search of the lantern. And when the flash of lightning electrified the sky outside my bedroom window, that's when I saw him. That first lightning strike was quick, like somebody flicking a light switch on and off, but I still noticed something different in the silhouette of Cemetery Hill. Remember, I'd stared at that hilltop my entire life before I'd headed off to college, its image imprinted in my memory. What I saw in that brief illumination was a figure standing taller than the crooked tombstones. A human figure. I blinked fast in the dark, as if trying to clear my vision, already trying to convince myself I'd been mistaken. But somehow, I already knew the truth. I knew what I'd just seen. Who I'd just seen. Jordan was standing atop Cemetery Hill, staring right at me and I could feel his anger charging the air, seeking me out. No. I tried again, trying to be rational. That's impossible, and ridiculous, and you don't believe in that sort of... But then, like a fireworks show finale, a minefield of lightning zapped and arced and burned across the sky all at once, creating an apocalyptic sunset lasting what might have only been three or four seconds, but was long enough. Long enough for me to see the figure, still standing atop the hill, reach up toward their head with one hand and, like the lightning in the sky, a memory lit a white-hot trail through my mind, and I watched as the figure on the hill mimicked what the Jordan in my memory did in his front yard on the day my parents drove me through town on my way to college. Our unofficial goodbye. He tipped his hat to me. A hat I didn't have to see to recognize. A scream welled up from somewhere deep inside me. 21. I almost didn't go through with it, visiting Jordan. Mr. DeMarco had given me Jordan's address, a subsidized apartment complex one town over that anyone who'd grown up in Red Lake knew was not a place you wanted to live if you could help it. But it took me four days to convince myself it was the right thing to do. Now, though, I'm not so sure. A selfish part of me wants to believe Jordan's end was inevitable, that he was already too far down his path. But my guilt continues to gnaw away at this notion, boring its way to the truth. It was my J.J. Games hat that finally forced me to get in the car and drive to Jordan's apartment. After calling the DeMarcos that day, I'd left the hat on the kitchen counter, just to the left of the door that led to the backyard. This had always been a bit of a catch-all place in our house, a place for keys, wallets, mail, and something instinctive in me had tossed the hat there when I'd hung up the phone with Jordan's dad. So, there it sat, and listen, I know this sounds nuts. I know you're going to read this and tell me I'm clearly experiencing some sort of mental episode and need to seek the help of a licensed professional, and fuck, you're probably right, but I'm only telling you the truth the way I know it to be. I could feel that hat watching me. When I cooked and ate my meals, its stare never left me. When I sat in the living room and watched TV, I could sense its growing impatience with me. And when I got into bed at night and tried to sleep, I... Christ, I can't believe I'm even admitting this. I felt bad for it. 
I thought it must be lonely down there in the dark by itself. And that's when I understood the game my mind was playing. I was projecting my emotions about my dilemma with Jordan onto the damned hat, turning it into a sort of inanimate physical representation of my mental struggle. I knew then that I had to go see Jordan. I just didn't know it would end up killing him. 22. For some quick perspective, Jordan's apartment complex was the sort of place where you double-checked that you'd locked your car doors and watched your step unless you wanted to squish or crunch discarded sex, drug, or alcohol paraphernalia. Like I alluded to before, the place had a reputation. My heart started to ache for my old friend the moment the building came into view, but when I parked at the rear of the lot and stared out the windshield, I realized I had no idea what I was going to say or do when I saw him. I climbed the steps to Jordan's second floor apartment, shamelessly clutching the tiny bottle of pepper spray in my pocket. When I knocked on the door, which caused a dog to bark a few doors down, I suddenly found myself hoping and praying that nobody would be home. Who's there? A voice called from inside the apartment. Jordan's voice. Different from when I'd last heard it. Rougher somehow, but still him. I'd know it anywhere. Uh, hey man. It's me, Jeremiah. For a long time, nothing happened. The dog a few doors down barked again. In the parking lot, an engine started and tires screeched as the car sped out of the lot. Then the door opened. Just a crack at first, a few seconds of silent observation, and then it was pulled open wide. He was too thin. That's the first thing that really struck me. Jordan had always been the more muscular of the two of us, getting downright ripped during high school baseball seasons, but now he looked like a strong breeze could blow him over. His t-shirt billowed at his sides, his arms like toothpicks out the sleeves. And his arms. Red splotches and scratches, bruises, and even what looked like a couple burn marks. I made myself stop staring and glanced up to his face, seeing the dark circles under his bloodshot eyes. His lips were slightly chapped and cracked, and he needed to shave, but he'd always worn stubble well, better than I ever had. It was then that I realized I wasn't so much staring at Jordan as he was staring at me. He had a bemused, somewhat intrigued look on his face, his bloodshot eyes questioning. It was as if he was trying to figure out if I was actually standing there in front of him, and if I was, why? The silence stretched on and on, both of us unsure how to close the gap of all the years. It's an odd thing to go from having somebody be such an integral part of your life and then poof, it's as if you don't even know each other at all anymore, like you don't need each other anymore. To realize that what for so long felt unquestionably permanent was in reality fragile and fleeting and, if you weren't careful, forgettable. Want to get lunch? I asked, my throat dry. I swear I thought he was going to say no. He just kept looking at me for several more seconds, but then finally his chapped lips twitched and he said, sure, give me five. When he headed back into his apartment and was closing the door, I got a quick look inside. The door opened into what was presumably the living room, and there was no furniture except a tattered brown love seat with no legs in the middle of the room, and a cheap particle board entertainment sitter against the wall with a decent-sized television atop it. But what I saw neatly arranged along the two shelves of the entertainment center and on the floor on both sides of it made me smile. Jordan had at least ten different video game consoles on display and connected to the television, ranging from the more modern devices all the way back to things we had when we were just kids. He was still a gamer. At least he still had that joy. 23. The echo of my scream was still fading away in my bedroom when another flashbulb of lightning created one more freeze frame of Cemetery Hill outside my window. The crooked tombstones and the immortal oak tree were still there, but Jordan was gone. 
Panic and fear, the likes of which I'd never experienced, a true understanding of the word terror, seized me and fried my circuits, my brain regressing back to that of a child. I squeezed my eyes shut against the darkness, terrified and unwilling to see any more of what might be outside my window. I fumbled in the dark and found my bed, climbed in and pulled the covers over my head and held them tight against me like armor as I balled myself into the fetal position. He's not there. I tried to reassure myself. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. He's dead. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. But he was. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. Where did he go? At some point, while my mind raced and the storm continued and I didn't dare remove myself from the comforter cocoon of safety, exhaustion won me over and I fell into a broken sleep. I ebbed in and out of consciousness repeatedly to the sound of a clap of thunder or a gust of wind screaming through the yard. Once, as I was deliriously drifting back under, one crack of thunder was so sudden and sharp that when I snapped awake, I actually thought the noise had come from inside the house. In the morning, I found out that it had. 24. Jordan emerged from his apartment within the promised five minutes. He traded his t-shirt and sweatpants for a wrinkled polo shirt and blue jeans that had a small hole in one knee. He doused himself in some sort of body spray or cologne, and as he closed and locked the apartment door behind him, I had to step back to keep my eyes from watering. Thankfully, by the time we'd reached my car, the scent had lessened, or maybe I'd just gotten used to it. Uh, I can just meet you there, Jordan said, standing in front of my car, looking uneasy. I scanned the parking lot, seeing a scattering of vehicles that all looked as though their odds of passing state inspection were slim to zero. I wondered which one might be Jordan's, as I saw no sign of the red Honda Civic he'd driven in our high school days. Jordan had loved that car and always kept it clean, inside and out. I wondered what had happened to it. Why waste the gas, I said. Come on, hop in. It was on the short drive to the chain steakhouse I'd chosen for lunch that I noticed the other thing that was wrong with Jordan. He was twitchy, constantly shifting and adjusting himself in the seat like he was a trapped animal waiting to break free. Thankfully, the drive was short, and I filled the silence with small talk about the changes in town since the last time I'd been out that way. Our meal together oscillated mostly between uncomfortable silence and awkward-slash-forced chit-chat the latter of which was mostly my doing. But occasionally, in a few genuine moments, it was as if Jordan would let his guard down and his eyes would spark to life, and I too would feel a comfortable release wash over me and... And we were in high school again. Two best friends hanging out, no worries in the world, not yet exposed to the hardness of life. We reminisced about what we both would happily agree to call the good old days and we laughed over some of the stupid shit we'd done. Honestly, I couldn't remember the last time I'd laughed that hard. But after the third time Jordan excused himself to go to the restroom, the laughter became harder to come by. After the fourth time, I could no longer ignore the terrible, tragic truth. The weight loss, the marks on his arms, the jitteriness, the eyes... Jordan DeMarco was an addict. 25. And here's where I messed up. Here's where I probably killed him. When the waitress brought the check to the table, it was a reminder to me that I'd gone the entire meal without really asking Jordan questions about himself. I think I knew better, to be honest, that no good would come from that line of questioning, but another part of me also didn't want Jordan to think that I didn't care about him, that I was so self-absorbed in my own admittedly successful life that I had no interest in his. So, in the second dumbest thing I did that day, we'll get to the first in just a minute, I asked Jordan, as casually as I could as I slid my credit card into the little bill holder and scooted it to the edge of the table for the waitress to see, what sort of thing he did for work these days. Instantly, I regretted it. What little life was left in his eyes snuffed out like extinguished candle flames. 
and his head drooped down. He stared at the table for a few seconds and then shrugged. Whatever I can find, he said. Fast food cook, construction, convenience store cashier. He kept staring at the table and, with immense honesty, added, I usually get fired. It's just hard to care about that shit, you know? I didn't know what to say, so I just agreed. He looked up then and gave me the tiniest, saddest grin. I've only ever been good at one thing. You know that. A collage of images of the two of us huddled around a computer screen over the years flip-booked through my mind, and I tried so hard to match the face in front of me to that boy I used to know. All I did was nod. I knew what he meant, even though he hadn't quite gotten it right. He was good at a lot of things, but he'd only ever been passionate about coding and his games. He'd been a hell of a programmer. Even in college and then with my company, I'd seen very few people who possessed the sort of natural knack for reading and writing computer code that Jordan had shown the signs of when we were younger. Across from me in the booth, Jordan sat up and took a deep breath and in what had to be a decision he'd been struggling with since I first showed up at his door, he looked me in the eye and asked, I don't suppose you have a job for me at that big company of yours, do you? Then, perhaps to let me know he wasn't just looking for a big handout, he added, I'd do anything, Jerry. Nobody but Jordan and my parents had ever called me Jerry. Not even thinking about what his question really meant, not understanding the humility and bravery he just showed, I answered in the most asinine and insensitive way possible. Well, I smiled and even laughed a bit. I just sold my company, so I guess you could say I'm in between jobs myself right now. I'd meant it to be self-deprecating. He held my stare for another beat or two. Then he looked away and nodded. Sure, he said. I understand. 26. It wasn't until I was driving home after dropping Jordan back at his apartment that I realized how idiotic I'd been. In between jobs? I shook my head and cussed at myself. I was a literal multimillionaire, and somebody who was at one time very important to me, and clearly not doing well at all, had asked me for help and I didn't even offer them a promise for the future. Forget the now. I couldn't even tell them I'd make some calls or... Fuck. Idea after idea of ways I could have helped Jordan, things I could have offered him, chased me all the way home. I don't know if he would have accepted all of them, but at least I would have known that I'd done my part. I would have been the friend he desperately needed. I would have been the friend I used to be. As I turned onto my street, another idea struck me, one that I thought might be perfect. Back in San Francisco, where my office had been, I knew the name of a supposed great rehab clinic. Very upscale and professional, very discreet. The type of place celebrities went to get themselves cleaned up. Hey, millionaire tech bros like to snort coke too, apparently. People talk. I would call and arrange for Jordan to go. I'd pay for everything, fly out with him, get him settled. Then, when he'd gotten himself together, I'd help him find a job. I had the connections, I had the reputation. Somebody would do me a favor and get Jordan in the door. I'll do anything, Jerry. God, those words will haunt me. I knew I could find him something, but I never got the chance. 27. The next morning... Mr. DeMarco called my cell phone and let me know that Jordan's roommate had come home from working the night shift and found Jordan dead on his bedroom floor. The assumption was that he'd overdosed. 28. The world did not end the night of the storm, and the sun mercifully rose again in the morning. I woke, drenched in sweat, still curled up beneath my comforter. When I tossed the covers off me and stood, letting the sunlight coming through the window wash over me, I stared out across the yard and directly to the top of Cemetery Hill and quickly grounded myself back in reality. A dream, I thought. 
or some sort of what? Grief-induced hallucination? Whatever the explanation, in just a quick minute after waking, I'd already convinced myself that my terror from the night before had been completely unwarranted. I'd gotten myself worked up over nothing, my mind playing tricks on me as I struggled to work through my conflicted emotions, mourning the tragic loss of my friend. But despite all that, I was once again certain of one thing. The dead stay dead. I was practically floating with relief as I made my way down the stairs to make my coffee, euphoric in that feeling one gets when a great crisis has been avoided. When I stepped into the kitchen, the feeling drained away and was replaced with a chill that seeped into my bones, iced my veins. The back door was halfway open. One of the door's panes of glass was broken, jagged chunks of it on the floor, mixed with a few scattered leaves that had blown in from the yard. On the inside of the door, all around the thumb latch for the deadbolt and the handle, were smears of dirt and mud. Leading away from the doorway to the kitchen table were muddy shoe prints and puddles of dirty brown water, their spacing uneven and haphazard in their path, as if whoever had left them were stumbling more than walking. On the kitchen table, soaking wet and graffitied with muddy fingerprints, was my once blue JJ Games baseball cap. 29. I can't tell you exactly how many days ago that was. I think two, but it might have been three. I've hardly slept at all, and time has both stopped mattering and managed to run altogether. It took me all this time to figure out exactly what I needed to do, how I could achieve some closure. That's why I've sat here and typed this all out for you. Because somebody needs to know, needs to understand what I did and what I'm going to do. I'm wearing my JJ Games hat now. It has been keeping me company while I've told my story, whispering in my ear and telling me to hurry up and get on with it. I think I understand its message now. There's only one way I can absolve myself from my transgressions. Jordan is waiting for me on Cemetery Hill. I can't see him now, but I know he's there. I can feel him. The bond of our long-ago friendship having grown stronger now in death. I'm going to go join him in the dark and take his hand and let him lead me. Where? I don't know. To his grave? Somewhere beyond? Wherever I end up, I know I deserve it. I left him once. He won't let me do it again.